Awareness, the final frontier. These are the explorations of Jonathan Robinson and Brian Tom O'Connor. Their continuing mission, to discover fresh new paths to the mystery within, to seek out new joys and new methods of awakening, to boldly go into the heart of expanded consciousness. This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome, welcome, fellow explorers. I am Jonathan Robinson, and I'm here with my cosmic comrade, Brian Tom O'Connor. Good to see you, Brian. And I know you're very excited about today's topic because you've been saying, we should do a topic on non-duality. And I finally relented. So, <laughs> so here we are. We get to explore not just what it means that we're all one and everything's one and, and such, but what are the ramifications of that? And what are the practical implications of looking at the world through the non-duality lens? So. When you first think of this subject of non-duality, as a fellow explorer, what comes up for you? Well, I think of non-duality as basically meaning there's only one thing going on. Non-duality, the term originally was an English translation of the uh, Sanskrit term Advaita, which means not two. So it means that there aren't two things. There isn't myself and the world, there isn't separate things. It's all just one thing going on. Some people call it consciousness. Some people call it the absolute. I like to think of it as energy rising and falling and playing out in temporary forms that come into being and then go away, much like our famous waves and the ocean analogy. Yeah, I like that analogy because there's really only one ocean, whether it's a wave or it's a uh, ocean. I also like the analogy of energy because it's pretty easy in this age of science to think of everything as energy. Even you know, our thoughts create energy or our body is made of energy or the trees made of energy. So I think it's important that we have an analogy that works for us. You know, at one time, people would say it's all God, and you don't hear that term very much anymore, um, or consciousness, but that doesn't evoke anything. And I think in an age where uh, there's science and physics, it's important to come up with a metaphor that feels current for you, so you can kind of get a sense that there is only one thing in many different forms. And, you know, when I read about physics, it helps me to get this idea of non-duality because physicists will often say that all the particles are entangled, they all are in some way connected to each other, and you know we are stardust. You know the 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 molecules in our body came from the stars. That's hard to believe, or through a supernova, and we're all connected. Uh, one of my favorite things I've read is that every person on earth has at least a million molecules or atoms, I forget which one, that were in Jesus and Buddha. So everything's very interconnected and it's helpful to have these ideas to, to move us in that direction. And I'm wondering if you have any favorite ideas or, or thoughts that help you to connect with that oneness. Well, when we breathe, we breathe in air from the atmosphere, and we absolutely could not exist without the air from the atmosphere. It's not like we are these individual things, and then there's air, and the air is like we fill up our gas tank with gas. We just put a little air in, and then we go on, and if we run out of air, we still exist. The interaction, the flow of breathing is, is actually an energy exchange, a continuous energy exchange. And every cell in our body, I mean, science says that they replenish themselves every seven years or something, so that there's actually no cell in our body that was here seven years ago. So this continuing interaction 
chemically, physically, molecularly with the environment is one of the things that can help lead us to a sense of oneness. Yeah. And just that body analogy is a good one. You know, we don't think our left hand is better or separate than our right hand or our foot is different than our body. So all these cells are part of our body. And then maybe this body, uh, when I've had, say, mystical experiences, I see it's part of a bigger body, say the body of humanity. And that humanity is part of a bigger body, which is life on Earth. And life on Earth is part of a bigger body, which is life in the galaxy. And, and there, is no, there are no separate boundaries, although words can make us think that there are. You know, body, me, you, Earth, Pluto. Uh, but there are no boundaries between everything, really. Well, that's the nature of words and language. Uh, they are pretty much designed to make distinctions between things so that these physical bodies can survive better. It can tell the difference between uh, safety and danger, between poison and food. Um, but it's hard to fathom non-duality with language because language is separation. And if there is no separation, then language cannot adequately describe it. So we sort of have to feel into it. We sort of have to use little tricks of the imagination. You could simply just imagine all is one. Imagine that what's looking out through your eyes is the universe looking out your eyes. It's identical with what's looking out everyone else's eyes. And what it's looking at is itself. Just like if I look at my hand, I don't think, oh, that hand is separate from me. Imagine if I looked at the window, if I looked at the tree, if I looked at you, that I was simply looking at parts of me. Yeah, I love that metaphor that when I look at somebody, I often will think this is either if I'm, if I'm upset at them or if I don't like them, I think of it as this is a disowned aspect of me. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, this is another aspect or a sub-personality of me. I just get to see it in three dimensions in front of me now. Or, alternately, if there's some person or something I love, that this is a uh, part of me. And, you know, a beautiful part of me. And that helps me to feel less separate. I think the forces of separation now are so strong that anything we can do to balance the scales and look at the world as it's all one is helpful to our mental health because ultimately it is all one. And as we align with that reality, I think we actually experience more peace. Yes, absolutely. But for some people, it's a little bit hard to accept that we are all one, that universal consciousness is what's looking out. And I think that there, I think you don't have to believe it in order to experience the peace of oneness. But there is also possibly a, uh, an intermediate step that you might take. So if you were to look at your own awareness and realize that it allows everything. Anything that appears in awareness, it allows, like a mirror that doesn't decide what to reflect. It simply reflects everything in front of it. And so in that way, awareness is qualityless. It's clear. It's empty. It's choiceless. So it actually has no qualities of its own, in which case my awareness and your awareness are absolutely identical differences between us are only objects in awareness, but awareness itself is identical. And I think that's a very good intermediate step that you could take when you realize that what's looking out through my eyes is identical to what's looking out through your eyes. Then it's a small step to what's looking out through my eyes is the same as what's looking out through yours. Yeah. 
And, you know, we all have to find our way into that experience. I remember once I was talking to uh, spiritual teacher Ram Dass. I may have said this in another episode, but it really stuck with me. I was asking him how to feel closer to God. And he said something that he had done was he imagined God was an imaginary playmate. So if he was out taking a walk, he would talk to God as his playmate, you know, like you might have when you're five years old. And he'd say, wow, that's a really beautiful job you did with that tree. Or I really love how you created that person out there. They're so wonderful. And as he did this, that playmate became more and more real. And he became less and less real. So eventually, he realized that God was completely real and he was imaginary. <laughs> and that helped him to see that it was all God. So, you know, whatever works for you. One of the things that's helped me to see oneness in action in daily life, which is something I'm always interested in, is relationships, especially uh, intimate uh, relationships. You know, many years ago, I wrote a book called Communication Miracles for Couples, and it became a bestseller. So I got to do a lot of couples counseling as a psychotherapist, you know, helping couples. And what I saw was that all couples who were doing poorly had one problem. And that was they thought there were two people fighting against each other. And there was always blame. And all the couples I knew who were doing well saw that there was really only one, they were both in the same boat. You know, if you're in a boat with one other person, you don't shoot their side of the boat hoping that they sink first. You know, that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. So couples in trouble, what they do is they blame and they, they badmouth their partner thinking that that will make them higher. But if there's only, you don't shoot your left hand thinking that that's going to help my right hand. You take care of your left hand if it's hurt. And I think that's a good metaphor for seeing that we're all one and people who take care of their partners and relationships and see it in that context have good relationships and they get to experience love and love is the natural experience of oneness. That's right. Love is the actual nature of ourselves as the one universe, the one thing that's going on, the one thing that allows whatever happens to happen, whatever, whatever that is that is choiceless, which is ultimately unconditional love. And it's ultimately our true nature. And that can be your temperature gaze as to how much you're experiencing oneness. If you're feeling love, you're experiencing oneness. If you're not feeling love, then you're in, locked in some dualistic way of looking at the world. That's right. But I like the way you talked about love in particular, because some people might think of love as desire. In mm -hmm. other words, I'm in love with this person because I completely desire a relationship with them. I want to hold them, kiss them, have sex with them, be romantic, marry them, identify with that. And, and, and it's, that's not the kind of love we're talking about. We're talking about the kind of love where the other person really is seen as a part of you. In other words, love thy neighbor as thyself doesn't mean love your neighbor as if that neighbor were you. It means that neighbor is you. If you yeah. love yourself, you love your neighbor equally, the same. And all of humanity is simply one organism. If we imagine the, even the planet, much less the universe, as one organism, then we're going, to, we're going to look at other people and even other creatures with respect, love, and the desire to help and not harm. Yeah, and we 
so easily in this culture, what I call the culture of uh, America, or, or now it's infecting the rest of the world, of always trying to create a competition or an adversary, which is something our minds do. Uh, even when we're so-called playing tennis, people don't really see it as play, they see it as competition. Mm -hmm. But our so-called adversaries are really part of us that allow us to interact in a way that allow us to be our best. Rather than seeing them as an enemy, see them as someone who makes us stronger. That's a non-dualistic way of looking at things. And I think those types of ways of looking at things are a step up from what we're kind of taught in these uh, game shows and reality shows and, and all the political rhetoric that happens nowadays. Oh, absolutely. Our whole politics is, well, I call it the sportsification of politics. We think of ourselves as belonging to one team and we're good and the other team is bad and we're going to pretty much do whatever we can to make sure the other team loses. And it does get a little crazy, but what this does bring up though is a major paradox of non-duality because competition actually is a major part of life. It does exist. It exists in evolution and it exists in things like applying for college or getting a job. I mean, we do compete with other people for jobs. And so competition is actually part of life. So therefore, is competition not non-duality? And the paradox of non-duality really is that duality is a part of non-duality. It exists within it. It's everything. So that when we reject certain ideas or emotions or simply reality, that's when we're denying non-duality, when we reject absolutely any aspect of reality. Resistance is futile. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Resistance is stepping into a false version of reality because you're now trying to create two when there's really just one. That's right. As Byron Katie says, when you argue with reality, you lose, but only always. Yeah, yeah. But yes, you're right about resistance. It really is resistance to what is that gets us into trouble emotionally. It doesn't mean we can't take action. If we see something wrong, if we see an injustice in the world, we can take action to correct it. But when we emotionally allow the fact that, yes, this exists, and don't have this idea that it shouldn't have happened, that frees up a lot of our psychic energy to then act in an effective way to right a particular wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, something that I'm, a, I'm interested in is how do we move towards this all one experience? Now, there's certainly the age old methods. You take a lot of drugs, <laughs> you know, that'll do it. Or you spend a fair amount of time in nature. And I think most of us don't have the time or the access to long periods in nature like we used to. So that isn't as uh, available to most of us as it used to be. Um, one method I've used lately is just the mantra, it's all one. You know, it's like a little bit of reminder. Uh, I might do that with my feeling, you know, this feeling going through me is just, it's part of the energy of the universe. Or this person who I might be feeling separate from, you know, it's, that's, that's a part of, me as well. That can be effective, but I'm wondering if you have any tricks like that. I think one of the best ways is through silence. Because as we said before, words are all about separation. 
and the mind is the organ of separation. It makes distinctions between things. So silence, and particularly wordlessness, is a very good way to get a feel for oneness because when you sit and see how long you can go without words going through your head, without that inner dialogue, then you start to get a sense, the, the boundaries, the distinctions start to dissolve and you can get a sense of this oneness. And one more little tip about silence is that it's not about creating silence. It's not about really getting rid of things. So if you find yourself having trouble quieting the endless stream of words in your mind, one thing that helps is to see if you can notice the silence that's already there, that those thoughts are appearing in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a good way. And I think you also don't need silence. You just need um, a different relationship to sounds. Mm -hmm. you know, think of it that you're in a field of sounds and sounds don't separate they all enter the ears at the same time. So when I get into a, like a passive listening gesture in which all sounds are entering to me without me having to differentiate them, that can help me to experience a field of sound, a field of silence that not only quiets my mind, but helps me to feel like everything is interconnected in one. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's interesting. We both have come up with very precise, individualized ways of tapping in. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's part of everybody's exploration. What helps you to feel oneness? Because if you can tap into that reality, or let's say relax into that reality, um, then your vibration changes because now you're more aligned with reality. That's right, your vibration changes. When you, and sometimes all you really have to do is imagine. I think I said already in this podcast, because I say this over and over again, you don't have to believe that these concepts are true. Imagination is an amazingly powerful force. You can simply imagine that everything you see is appearing in the exact same field of awareness as everything else. All the sounds that you're hearing are appearing in the same field. All the sights you're seeing are appearing in the same field. And that field of awareness has one quality to it, the quality of quality lessness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's the same for everybody. And I'm going to talk about the dream analogy a little later in the guided meditation, but imagine you're having a dream. You're a character in the dream. There are things that you are seeing in the dream. And what are these things made of? It's all dream stuff. You, the body that's running around in the dream, is just made of dream stuff. The things that you're seeing, the, the other people, the monsters that are chasing you, the buildings, the cars, it's all dream stuff. And if you just imagine, well, what if that was true of waking life? What if everything that I am experiencing, everything that I'm seeing, hearing, touching, including myself, is all made of that same dream stuff, the dream of universal consciousness? Just as you say that, I can feel my consciousness shift a little bit. And, you know, it's interesting. We have, say, a billion tons of impressions about separation and individualism and competition and blame. But we have very few books or media or discussions about oneness. So it's a little bit unfair. The only thing we have is that is the reality. <laughs> the reality is, it is all one, but we don't talk about that. We don't have books about that. It'd be hard to have an exciting book that would basically be, yeah, it's all one. It's all interconnected. Repeat that statement 5,000 times. <laughs> you know, that would, be, that would not be a bestseller. 
No, it might not be. And it, 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 I remember when I was uh, first writing a book, I imagined that if I picked up a book that would speak to me directly, it would pretty much just have the same thing on every page. Just look inside, notice that what's looking out through your eyes is universal consciousness or awareness. We should try to write that book. It, it wouldn't take long. All you would need to do is on every page, right? It's all really one. It's, it's all, all really one. It's yeah. all one. Yeah. We'll, Be, we'll call that book The Secret Thing, The Secret That Leads to Eternal Happiness and Ultimate Reality. Yeah. And, the subtitle will be longer than the book itself, or at least exactly. any single page. I think it has possibilities. A long time ago, there was a book called Everything Men Know About Women. And when you open the book and start reading, it was completely blank. <laughs> right. So uh, we're on to something. I'm sure that'll be our next bestseller. Uh, we'll, we'll see. So any other thoughts or tips you have for helping people to feel this actual reality that uh, we rarely talk about? No, I think that we covered a covered a lot and I don't want to give away some of the things that I'm going to help our uh, listeners through during the guided meditation. Yeah. I know for me, there's certain poets that help because we don't have books or movies about oneness, but we do have people like Rumi or Hafiz that are all talking about how everything is one or interconnected. And even occasionally there's a song that might move us in that direction. I think it's important that we not just have an intellectual idea of oneness, but we have a heart or emotional connection because love is the closest thing to oneness. And whenever we experience a heart opening or we experience love, that's that's a sense that we're getting aligned with this oneness. And, and I think that that helps us to move us in that direction. Absolutely. After all, what is love other than the absence of the sense of separation between yourself and another? And it sure feels good. And rather than think like, I love you, it's more like we have relaxed into a bathtub of love together. That sounds very nice <laughs> in so many ways. And with a, a mystic, that bathtub gets bigger and bigger That's until right. it includes all the animals and the plants and every person alive and the air and the earth and the universe. Sure, there's a metaphor for you. One gigantic, infinite bathtub. <laughs> of love. A bathtub of love. Uh-huh. <laughs> And That's we're our next relaxing in the uh, delightful soap bubbles of joy and happiness. <laughs> yes, yes. By the way, a couple of other uh, Walt Whitman was another poet that I think that um, really uh, had a sense of uh, understood the sense of oneness and interconnectedness of all beings, and also Rilke and uh, and there's there's actually a lot of them. And you, if you want to deep in, if you want to dive into. Uh, mystical poetry. There's a lot of poets. That's what they talk about. Mm -hmm. And strangely, you know, I interviewed um, astronaut Edward Mitchell uh, for the book I did called The Experience of God. And, and, you know, he said, looking from the moon, he was on the moon, he had a mystical experience of how, as you look down on Earth, it's clearly all one. And he had some nice writings about that and then talking about the physics of that. And so I think even some of the, the best known physicists, that that's your language of poetry that can help you to truly dive deeper into the reality that is always there. Yeah. Beautiful. Very insightful. So, so why don't you, um, lead us with your mystical poetry and meditation into an experience of, of oneness. All righty. 
Uh, this is called Imagining Oneness. And you can listen with your eyes open or closed. I usually recommend closing your eyes, unless of course you're driving. Start by taking a slow, easy breath. And noticing if there's any tension or clutching anywhere in your body. If there is, simply notice it. Take another easy breath. This is a game of imagination, which means you don't have to believe any of the ideas I talk about. You only have to try them on for size and imagine what if they were true. Imagine that there's only one thing going on, simply vibrating energy, taking on a variety of temporary forms. It's like when you dream. When you dream, nothing in the dream has any separate existence outside of the dream. Everything in the dream, including you, the dream character running around in the dream world, is made up of the same thing. Let's call it dream stuff. Now imagine, just for now, that you, the waking person, running around in the real world, is simply a dream that the universe is having. One of many simultaneous dreams. Everything you, the dream character, sees, including yourself, is all made of the same dream stuff. Instead of dream stuff, we could call it energy. Everything you can see, feel, hear, taste, touch, is made up of this one universal vibrating energy. When things move, it's simply this one universal vibrating energy playing with form as it rises and falls, ebbs and flows in an infinite dance. Imagine that you are also made up of this vibrating energy. And as you breathe in and out, you're simply dancing with yourself, the universe. Let's call this one universal vibrating energy oneness. If there's only one thing going on, could there be anything that is not oneness? When you see other people, could this be anything other than oneness experiencing itself? When you look out through your eyes at the world, could this be anything other than oneness looking at itself? Is anything apart from oneness? Pleasure, pain, spiritual ecstasy, ordinary moments? It's all oneness experiencing itself as pleasure, pain, spiritual ecstasy, or a totally ordinary moment. If there's nothing apart from oneness, can there be an experience and an experiencer? If there's nothing apart from oneness, what is looking out through your eyes right now? Could it be anything other than universal oneness looking at itself?
just for now, imagine that you are the universe looking through your eyes. And just like you might look out of your eyes at your hand, which you consider a part of you, the universe is looking at the world and only seeing itself. yourself, you, the universe, the one thing going on, the universal dream stuff. Now, take another easy deep breath and when it feels comfortable, Open your eyes and look out at yourself, the universe. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. There's something that deeply relaxes when you don't see nature or people is separate from you. Right. So true. I had the funny experience when I opened my eyes, I saw myself on the screen. So it was pretty easy to feel like, wow, not, I'm not separate from him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's true. But then you see my face up there too. Uh huh. And, uh, that's a great analogy because right now, both of our pictures are on my screen. Yeah. If I were to rub my finger across that screen, I would not see any separation whatsoever. It's just two different images taken by two different cameras, but it's all one screen. Yeah. There's a good analogy for oneness. Yeah. Hmm. Feels like a breath of fresh air when you relax into that bathtub of love. <laughs> the bathtub of love. <laughs> Ooh, I like how you say that. I think we got a hip hop hit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm particularly not a very hip person, but, um, you know, I'm game. Yeah, yeah. Sounds good. So any final words as we... Um, launch people into an experience this week of letting go of separation and recognizing, recognizing that they are one? Well, thank you very much for listening, everyone. I'm really grateful for your ears, and uh, which are the universe's ears. And the only thing I might add is that... Um, we love doing this podcast, and it is free on many channels, iTunes, YouTube, Lipson, Spotify, wherever your favorite podcasts are purveyed or projected. But it does cost money to um, put them together. So if you were to go to our website at awarenessexplorers.com and look for the donate button, we'd, we'd be very grateful if you wanted to, uh, to click that and maybe give a little to keep this uh, free podcast going. Also, there's uh, on the navigation bar, awarenessexplorers.com, there's all the meditations in one spot. And I think that's a great resource, one that me and a bunch of my friends are using on a daily basis uh, to bring people back to awareness, to oneness. And that's free. You know, unlike some of these apps like Headspace that costs a bunch of money, that's offered free. And I... Um, if I say so myself, uh, our meditations are really good. I enjoy them. <laughs> <laughs> Both of ours. <laughs> Said with complete humility. And also a lot of the other teachers that they really are putting out their best meditations for free. And some of them are just completely mind-blowing. Absolutely. So many that we've had on our show from Locke Kelly and Rupert Spira and Adya Shanti have wonderful meditations, both on our show and on YouTube. So take advantage of them. Yep. 
So till next time, be in oneness, see in oneness, and keep exploring. Keep exploring. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or your favorite podcast app. And we'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends. Because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.